essentially the first um, technique of the, I'd say probably of the most common uh, techniques that we're going to be uh, decision trees and then random forest. Um, and the simplest way that I saw to look at the uh, random forest is that like you've got a random forest is essentially just a bunch of decision trees and then the forest is all of those put together and then um, based off each of the individual trees and how they classified things that determines how you get your final output. Um, so for example, this one on the left here, you've got um, one instance and then you classify it as a yes or no. And then from there um, you take that and then is it classified as a yes or no? And then a yes or no. And you keep doing that and you do that for a bunch of different variables um, for your predictors. And the um, with the for genomic data in particular, so most genomic data is classified continuously, but for random forests and decision trees, you need to do that as a um, binary value. So like, is the gene expression of this particular gene greater than a 200 fold or something like that? So instead of having the actual value itself uh, be the predictor, you're looking to see if that gene value is above or below a certain threshold. And that would be your decision node on each of um, each node there would be the um, would be a value like that. So if you've got, you know, there's samples that I think has like 20,000 different genes. So you could each have one gene here. Okay, is this your starting point? Um, here is the gene expressed over 2,000 fold, yes or no. And then is another gene expressed over 2,000 fold, yes or no. And each of these trees is done randomly. So it's not like each tree is sampling the same thing. You're picking individual samples not individual samples, um, it's randomly picking values that they say is above or below a, a cutoff, or if it's a yes, no, like does this person have this or not? Um, so that's what the random forest essentially is. And to do that in R, um, it's still part of the carrot model. So um, the method that they use for here is the ranger method of the, um, for making these random forests. Um, and the, something I didn't put on here specifically, but is discussed in the book is the concept of the, um, the Gini coefficient. So each node, when it's split, um, the Gini coefficient of the Gini impurity is, um, how homogeneous the sample is then split. So if you have a split that is exactly 50-50, um, for a particular node, um, the impurity is going to be 0.05. And the way that the um, Gini uh, impurity is set is essentially it's just um, 1 minus the sum of squares for the split. So here they have the example if you have a node and you had 75% of your um, samples were split into one class and then 25% were split into the other class, you have one minus the set square of 75%, so 0.75, plus the square of um, 0.25. Um, so together, that would be a 0.375. Um, and so if you, that's a, the closest it is to 0.5 is going to be the most even split. So you're looking when you make the um, trees, um, and this is something uh, Project Grace, you're from, uh, you probably you're definitely more familiar with it than I am, but you want the Gini coefficient to be, um, or impurity to be as close to, um, for the final nodes, I should say, like the final leaf of the tree, you want those to be as close to, um, do you want those as close to one or do you want them as close to 0.5? Because being as close to one, it would be like, okay, if you have this binary factor, of this factor is present, or this factor has a value greater than 2,000, it will absolutely be this. And then the likelihood of it not being that is very low if the Gini impurity is close to one. But if it's split in the middle, if it's closer to 0.5, 
that means that value is less. You can't say that particular value has a lot of um, predictive value in itself of whether it's going to um, be able to say it's classified as like, yes, this is this or no, it's not. Um, that's how I've interpreted it thus far. I need to do more reading um, to better understand that. Uh, do you have any insight into that, Frederica? No. Okay. That's fine. Um, so we'll, um, I'll have to go back and look at that later. Um, so from then generating the, um, the trees, um, as I said, these trees are all randomly sampled. Um, and you basically, the forest is just like the collection of all these individual randomly selected, randomly made trees. Um, so when you are doing this data, you know, you're splitting it randomly, there may be some that fit better than others just due to random choice. And so one way to counter that is, um, or not so much counter it, but um, when you're doing this, um, they're calling it out of the bag. Um, so you're estimating the um, prediction error from the training sample. So essentially, instead of splitting it quite totally into two parts, you're almost splitting the training data the training data into even further parts. You're building your random forest based off the training data, and then again, testing your training data with another part of the training data. So that would be like the out of the bag. Um, so they weren't used for the training of the tree, of that particular uh, model. Um, so going back to the, um, the code for it, um, Back to this one again. Um, so when you set the M try here, um, this is going to try a hundred different um, ensembles essentially. So, and you're training that with the the ranger method, as I said, was part of the carrot package, um, and then it's going to give you the final uh, predictive value for the um, out of bounds error. So this is 1.5%. So we'd say this is a pretty good, um, it's fit pretty well. It may even be almost too well, um, but this is, it was able to classify um, our data very well. Um, if we go back to here. Um, and then if we wanted to, we can impute the, um, which variables were the most important of this tree. And so we were able to plot that and you can see um, the importance was just on a scale of one to 100, like how important these are. So the two, um, the most, the 10 most important genes were listed here. And so TMP1 and PDPN in particular are um, highly predictive of uh, a subtype or not of having that. Um, that said, I don't know, you can't see from this directly how they, like what value this was if they use it, but they just said like, these are the gene predictors are most important. So it would get, you'd have to go back to look at the data to be, okay, is this um, gene expression higher? Um, and all of these subtypes are lower, um, but these would be the genes in this case to look at um, as the most predictive. So, the next method um, that is discussed is logistic regression. And uh, during log logistic regression, um, you can use it for both binomial classification of the livelihood of it, if you have the curve. Uh, let me go back to the, the book. Um, Yes, you can do the binary response or you can do um, the likelihood of, not the likelihood, um, my brain is not fully awake this morning yet, but when you're looking at the classification, uh, I'm going to come back to that. Um, 
but essentially with logistic regression, um, let me just draw on here. If you've got your graph and you've got a bunch of points here, and then you've got here, um, and you had um, the example that I looked at earlier this morning was um, the mice were obese. So we're going to call this OB mice down here, and then normal mice were here, and then um, this was weight. I'm going to just call that grams. There we go. Um, and so with logistic regression, um, you can draw a sigmoidal curve here, and each of these points would um, basically, based off the weight of the animal, you can use logistic regression to determine the likelihood of it being um, a normal weight animal or an obese animal. So if you've got an animal that weighs um, here and you draw that up, the crossover point here, um, in a binomial classification, the 50% cutoff point, which I'm just going to do that with this one, um, if the point falls below the curve, um, then you would be considered normal. And then if it's above, it would be considered obese in this case. So um, it's a way to perform. Um, it's another way of um, determining if the data are belonging to one set or another, as opposed to having with the random forest where you have kind of a more absolute, like it is this or it is not. And this is more predicting of how that can be. Um, oh, I just wanted to clear everything. Um, and when you are making that curve, you do also, you can fit the curve so that way it best predicts the weight. So like the, instead of the curve, um, like here, if you had the, cur you know, you can test one curve like this, but then maybe you also want to test it where it is like here, or then maybe even here. Um, so you you're fitting the curve, um, the maximum likelihood of like what's going to give you the best separation between your two data points with that curve. Um, and so you'll have to draw a couple, but like the um, equation for the curve when um, you're estimating that also. Um, so getting to the actual, uh, ARD code for it. Um, so we showed previously in, um, the previous example that down here that we have TMP1 and PDPN are both, um, very important variables in uh, classifying whether this cancer subtype, uh, phenotype is present or not. So in this example, they are using the TDPN gene um, to perform logistic regression. So looking to see um, the quantity, the, the fold expression of this particular gene, um, can it be used to um, predict whether it's going to be um, one phenotype or the other phenotype? Uh, so again, using the carrot package, um, and so on the previous code example, you notice here that the subtype, we are including all of the data here, um, and that's why we've got the, um, the period there as opposed to actually indicating what we're using. And here, we're just using the PDP engine. Um, so again, taking our training data, um, and we are also doing just the binomial classification um, Again, like where can this be predicted? Like, what is the threshold that will predict it be of the gene expression being um, the cancer phenotype or not being the cancer phenotype? Um, so we are training the model here, um, and then um, you're taking the output of this to um, get the um, the sigmoidal curve. And then you're able to then further predict the um, possibility, like the probability of that data. Um, and then you can actually see it um, expressed. So here, um, 
the top value is going to be, uh, I actually have to go back and look at this specifically. I don't know if it is like, you know, like is cancer or not cancer, but if I had to um, imagine, I'm going to say that the top is the not, is having cancer. So having like, highly decreased uh, PDPN expression um, is uh, not, these are the ones that are classified as not having, or as having the cancer. And then uh, the samples in the bottom do not have the cancer. Um, and the gene expression values of the ones that are not having cancer versus the ones that are having cancer up top. So um, this immortal curve was fit to best predict, um, okay, if you've got this whole expression of this gene, um, if it's, you know, really above zero at this point, okay, if you're doing increase in expression, then you probably don't have the cancer. Um, but if you've got decreased expression over the base, below baseline, um, how the extent of the decrease in fold expression of that gene um, is the likelihood of it being cancer or not cancer. Um, so here, if you've got, if we're going to estimate this as about being like 500, um, you could say it's probably about point about 20% of the likelihood that that particular um, sample um, will or will not, will have cancer about 20% and a bit more likely it's not going to. But if we have it closer to like 1500 over here, the likelihood is nearly um, one um, for this, like nearly 100% that it is going to have that cancer phenotype. And so if you think about so this particular example, we only did it for one gene. However, um, you could do this for uh, all of your genes. It would be pretty computationally expensive. And so it makes more sense to do it on the, um, the ones that are the most relevant uh, to predicting the phenotype as indicated by the random forest, but it still is a really good um, way to better classify the particularly important points. Um, and we then perform the confusion matrix to see um, how well the training data actually um, predicted it and 92% um, of accuracy. Um, and then when you perform the test on the actual test data, um, you're still getting very similar accuracy compared to the training data. So I'd say um, this is a pretty well fit model. Um, however, so we trained it specifically for this one subtype. Um, we like actually performed training data on this, like we fit the model with the training data. If we didn't use the training data um, and we just did all of the data as opposed to just the one particular subtype um, and there's no training control, um, you're getting perfect accuracy because you're only fitting it directly to the training data and you're not controlling for any potential variation um, later on. And so this would be a thing that, like this would be overfit. Um, but then when you go to actually perform the test data, um, you get 50% accuracy. So that's, you know, not acceptable for this. So if it's the accuracy of your training data is too high, um, it's more likely than not, not going to fit your test data very well. So you want to be sure you're controlling um, your um, training data, either if you're just looking at a particular subtype or um, if you have a, if you are training if you're looking at all your data, you still need to control um, it. So one way or the other. Go back down. Um, so there's ways to um, decrease the model variance. So, um, you know, ways to essentially not overfit your training data. Um, so one way to do this is um, looking at your, um, there's two different norms, and this is a concept that I'm not quite comfortable with just yet. Um, 
you did that. So if we're going here, um, they're calling it, uh, you're adding a penalty to it. Um, and that's known as the L2 norm or the L2 penalty. And it's the um, square root of the sum of the squared vectors. And so it basically, you're shrinking your, um, the coefficients in your regression closer to zero. Um, and there's different ways to do this. Um, and so if you're doing the sum of squares, it's called an L2. And then if you're just using the absolute values, instead of the squared values, that's called an L1 and it's on, um, or like known as like a lasso regression. And it's, um, they're both ways to help minimize um, or to prevent overfitting. And again, in terms of which one you use, it just depends on which one helps better explain the data. There's no like, okay, you must use this one for this particular type of data. Um, it's just a, they're both, they're just tools to uh, help shrink um, or help to add variation to your model. Um, it's kind of like when you're doing clustering, what if you pick Manhattan distance versus Euclidean distance, there's not necessarily a right or wrong. It's just a matter of what best explain, what helps to best explain um, your data. Um, that's the simplest way that I can uh, describe that. So um, in the example, um, when they're doing the controls, um, they're correcting for that um, during that. And the um, when you're doing the tuning for it, that's when it's actually happening as opposed to here where they didn't tune um, none of these tuned it specifically before. Um, and so when you're now creating the model, you're doing the same thing, but just actually tuning um, with the different parameters involved with your L1 and L2, um, the loss norms. And in here, when you, now that it's been tuned, the test accuracy jumps up to 98% as opposed to the 92%. Um, so this helps to increase the accuracy of the model. Um, and here, so before, let me go back to the other one. Um, here we see, okay, which of, based off this um, normalization that has occurred during the logistic regression, um, we see that um, these are the 10 genes that are the most predictive. Um, and again, so if you'll notice here, so PDPN is still there, but last time when we did this, um, TMP1, TIMP1 was the most um, important gene in determining this. But now that when we've um, normalized it, um, you have GAL and T13 as your most important gene. A lot, like, there's a lot of overlap between the two. Um, there's some overlap, I should say, but it does change. And so this is, there are important things to look at for, um, again, you might say 92% accuracy. Okay, that's still pretty good, but um, how close, you know, how close can we get it to perfect without it actually being perfect? Because um, there's always going to be some variation in real life data. Um, so that is a very, very quick crash, crash course into logistic regression and uh, random forest, which are probably two of the most common ones. Um, and this is, again, something that I absolutely will be, there's going to be a lot of YouTube watching between now and the next session to uh, better comprehend those methods. Um, so there's other algorithms, too, that are kind of loosely based off or based off um, random forest and logistic regression. So one option is uh, gradient boosting. So with traditional random forest, you're, you have your data and then you're making these random decision trees um, and that's all done in parallel. But when you are doing gradient boosting, on the other hand, you have your initial data and you are then putting it through a decision tree. Um, and instead of doing all the, the data randomly sampled, 
together, um, like randomly sampled in parallel, you are taking the data, putting it through one classifier, and then taking that classified data and then putting through another classifier, and then you're continuing to do that. So you're doing it sequentially. Um, and so that's one way um, it can um, overfit sometimes, but it does um, really fine tune the forest to be able to actually, the classification trees um, to actually be uh, predictive of um, the of what you're looking for. So for a, for this example, so we showed previously like the 10 genes that are the most important in terms of predicting whether the cancer phenotype is present or not. Um, in doing the boosting, you could it would essentially have the classifier through the most important and it would take that data and then take it to the second most important and then go to the third most important. So it would go through that it would go through all of those genes sequentially as opposed to just testing all of them at random in parallel. Um, so to do that, um, using a package called uh, XGBoost, um, and then they're training the model with the XGB tree. Um, and here they're tuning the model, so they're attempting to go through 200, um, going through 200 trees, so it's like sequentially going through 200 trees. Um, and um, when they fit that, um, so they had 130 samples, 804 predictors, and either having the cancer or not having the cancer. Um, if it wasn't, if you didn't process the data or pre process the data and you just performed um, the, felt it like just performed the data, the trees off that. Um, based off the different tuning parameters, um, you get fairly high accuracy um, depending on your ETA, um, the ones that you've tested, so you tested three different ones. Um, and then when you tune it further, um, the best fit for this, you had 200, like based off the three different ETAs, the best one was the um, 0.05. Um, and you can see that here that it gave, um, well, really the 0.5 and the 0.10 are better. It's probably likely that there's like very, very little difference between the two. Um, and that's just what they're showing there. But um, that's one way to do it. Um, support machine vectors or support vector machines. Um, I had a really nice video just pulled up. Let's see if I still have it pulled up. Um, okay, so in support vectors, essentially, um, when you've got a bunch of data, um, I'm gonna start drawing again. You've got data points, you've got something like this, just laid on the screen, and then um, got some red points. Um, what the, support vector is trying to do is to draw a line that best separates the two. Oh, the vanishing point, I want that. Um, that best separates the two. Um, and it's gonna do that for all of the variables um, continuously. So, um, and what it does is trying to find the best line between the two. And then essentially the, um, it's calculating the, distance from these points, the um, the distance from the line, and the ones that are the closest are called the margin points. And um, it's able to essentially like determine based off how far away it is from the margin, how the, um, what it should be classified as. And you can also, but sometimes like the data aren't necessarily like um, cleanly Split. Um, and I'm trying to find where on there they do it. Yeah, like this. Um, where, okay, to be able to put a single line in between here, like that, you, you can't split that just through a single line being drawn through here if you were to try. Uh, let me go back to the annotation. Yeah, so if you were to try to split a line here, like that doesn't it cleanly you know the concentric 
um, circles. I mean, you basically have concentric circles. There's no way you can just take a single line through here and try to split it. It would be, you know, curved. Um, so what was done here is that they transformed the data um, into uh, a new plane. And then from here, you can see that it, you're able to draw a line um, you can draw a single line through here, and then you could then calculate your margin from here to there, and then transform the data back into the um, single plane. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, the um, support machine vector learning, or support vector machine, excuse me. And then, um, so the package for this is Kern Lab to do support vector machines. Um, and again, just doing the five validation for it. Um, and you're testing, um, you're trying to tune it with your different um, sizes of it, essentially. Um, and the accuracy here is not as great as it was for the boosted, uh, the gradient boost. Um, really only about 68%, that's really not great. So this is with no pre-processing. Um, so you could say here that the support vector machine isn't really an appropriate model to be used for this um, data set. Um, and then there's another method that are neural networks. I didn't have time beforehand to get into to be able to explain neural networks. So essentially, it's just another machine learning method. And again, with the carrot method, you just change the method that you're trying to do. Um, and then um, you are testing that, it performs the model, it's fitting it, um, and again, um, based off the size, it still isn't great, um, this particular model. Um, so I would, you know, based off the four things that we've done, I'd say um, like the random forest, particularly the boosted, um, the gradient boost random forest was the most appropriate uh, supervised learning model. Um, and then finally, um, you can do ensemble models, which is basically just um, just kind of how a decision tree is a, or a random forest is an ensemble of a bunch of individual decision trees. You can do ensemble models where you've got um, different models all come together that are then trained for it um, to create an entire new model. So here you are doing um, just K nearest neighbors and then another model and then another random forest. Um, and then combining these together. Um, and the ensemble models together um, for all three of these individual models to be brought into one model essentially, um, about 90% accuracy. So um, these are sort of like a meta a meta model, if you will, that um, a model of all the models. Um, and I don't know the extent of like how it weights the models that are the most appropriate for one versus not. So like we saw that the gradient boost model was the most effective model for this. Does that take into, you know, does that give it more weight in the ensemble model versus um, the neural network or um, the support vector machine? model. I don't, I don't know if this is it, but that is something to look more into. Um, so as I mentioned previously, that when you're doing the logistic regression on this line, and instead of just having a subtype of 0, 1, you can also use it to uh, predict continuous variables. Um, so here, they, this is a different data set. So this isn't the cancer data set necessarily. This is, or it's not the cancer data set. Uh, they're looking at um, uh, methylation of genes and uh, age. So linking those together, um, you have data set here. And so the histogram of the uh, methylation values um, here versus how frequently they occur. So most, you know, um, unmethylated and then um, increasing methylation of particular um, genes, um, you're removing any that don't really contribute to it, and then performing random forest on this um, 
methylation data, again, using the Ranger method, um, tuning it. So in, you're just going to create, instead of creating 200 as I did before, this is just 50, um, 50 forest to try. Um, and then looking at the predicted versus the actual data and plotting it. So this is um, the predicted data. So you can see as the age increases, um, this is what the model was able to increase based off methylation. So with methylation, um, as we age um, and our epigenetic profile change, more likely to have methylation changes overall. And so increased methylation um, in some genes and then decreased methylation in others, depending on uh, the original phenotype. So um, this model was able to fairly accurately, I'd say pretty well, um, predict the observed age versus what um, was predicted by the model. Um, but when you are looking at, um, yeah, and then the inverse of this, essentially the residual um, is almost like the exact graph, but just going the opposite direction. So I'd say um, that was pretty well fit. Um, so that was a very, very quick summary of uh, the machine learning that um, like there are entire books dedicated just to this particular chapter. So there's no way we can get into all of the detail of it. But it's an, the takeaway is, I'd say, just like it is with the unsupervised learning, there are different methods that can be used to perform this. And the method you're using doesn't matter. It's just a matter of what is going to best fit your data. And so it's just good to know about the different ways you can test your model or train your model and then you know see how well it actually performs. Um, there's no, you must do it this way, or you have to do it this way. It's just really up to you to decide what is going to look best. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, any questions so far? I know I went through that kind of fast, but I mean, there's so much to um, right. really go into it. Mm -mm. Um. No, not for now, for, okay. for this chapter, no, because I had a look and, but maybe, uh, who, um, there's, um, I was thinking about uh, this, um, the method to use for um, making the model and I agree with you that it's the most suitable to you uh, that can be used. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Unless um, a, yeah. Yeah. When you are doing, like, for when you are fitting models for your work, um, do you often have one that you prefer over the other? Or are you doing, like you showed before, where you're testing a bunch of different models to see which gives you the best? results and like the best parameters and then you're just you're really going through like an extensive tuning process before you even get to doing the supervised learning yeah okay yeah because um it's the best way to to achieve uh, a very um uh credible prediction mm -hmm. Credible prediction means that you are uh, achieving something that which is close to reality. And to do, in order to do that, you might need to test different models and then tune as much as possible the other mm -hmm. parameters. So then, then what's what's the difference between modeling and machine learning uh, it's it's like um, about the other parameters so once you uh, like um, upsetting these those other parameters for future um, um, prediction of of this kind of data uh, and so you might want to to use the methods that is the, the most suitable to you 
for me, uh, I choose the method and um, it's, uh, th th there is even this uh, new, uh, new, that's not new, but MLR3, so machine learning are the D package, MLR3. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's another package, which is, uh, I don't know if you know, do, do you know about that? Mm -mm. Okay, so that is, that is like uh, a sort of a model, modeling language uh, as well as study models. Okay. And, but it's closer to uh, Caret than study models because it provides the function and then you put all the options inside. Okay. Like, uh, but it's it's faster. Somehow mm -hmm. faster when you try uh, different models and when you have uh, data sets which are of a certain dimension. And so basically, it depends by your data. We are talking about um, uh, so. The data sets which are composed of a greater number of predictors than observation somehow. And so uh, it might be, for example, for, to use ID models last week to, to, to give this yeah. uh, uh, translation of within um, caret and study models. So I had to subset the data set i couldn't use use it all right so yeah you might you might it, it depends by your data you might need to find a turnaround and you might want to sample your data as you did it as well so you take like 200 things and then you try it or a thousand things and then you try a part of your data um I think the, the best, the, 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 a good practice is to test different models with different, um, tune, with a good tuning of our parameters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Cause I, I think I, one thing I didn't like how this was presented in this chapter, it, it felt more like, okay, we're just going to do these different ones, but there, that was it. And, you know, if you didn't know, there was no general tuning, it was more of a like, let's go through and just try these different ones and then we'll pick the best one of those. But, if, you know, there's hundreds of different models you can pick. It's a disservice to not choose, to not at least attempt to look at all of them. Mm -mm. Right. So then yeah. the support vector machine, so this, mm -hmm. this device analysis, it's a sort of, it's, it's, it's modeling in itself. No, you know, you you use this the supervised analysis when you have a, a response, and so it is unsupervised when you don't uh, take consideration of the response variable, but you're just analyzing the the predictors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think it's a so it's it's still modeling, um, but considering uh, thinking about your response. So if your mm -hmm. results are uh, suitable and um, are the things that you are looking for uh, based on your response variable. Right, right. Yeah. Um, a lot for me to go look into later. <laughs> yeah. That's good, uh, that's good. Have a look. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, it's, I think that's it for chapter five. Um, I'll get the, the shared notes, my shared notes um, pushed and then I'll let you know when they're pushed and then if you want to push yours. Um, I was looking at the the calendar. So I, I'm i going to be going to do field work pretty much all of January. So I am not going to be able to make the, uh, let me go pull up the, um, so what you call it, the, the claim of week. Yeah, so I am, no, 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 no,
Can you hear me, Frederica, still? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Don't, yes. Hey. I can hear you. Okay, my computer just died, so I got to go plug it back in. But uh, <laughs> I okay. am out of the. Yeah, I'm going to be doing field work. Um, yeah, I'm basically my entire January, I'm not going to be available. I don't get back home until February 5th. So I don't know if we want to, you know, it's up to you. I feel like for this cohort, it's primarily just been you and I uh, going through this. So do we want to just pause for about six weeks or so? Um, or yeah, yeah, I, wanna... yeah um, um, it's a, it's it's even up to you uh, because if we take too much time within a, one session and another, now we have a couple of or oh, even three weeks uh, would would sound good, but more yeah. you know you lose too much time within the first pass and then, then the second pass, and then you need to go back somehow. Right. Right. So I want to suggest to do that if you like to like conclude the book and have a uh, an overview of what's happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we it's it's Christmas time, so uh, um, somehow we 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 have a break. Yeah, yeah, but um, I'm 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 not um I don't suggest to take more than three weeks off. Okay. Um, hmm. Well, that said, uh, but I it's could... fine, you know. Um, yeah. It's up to us. So if, if we like, we we can do that. Huh? That's yeah. Not um, yeah. This, so this is my first book club too. So I don't really know, like the, um, you know, if we want to do the summary. I'll leave it to you. I just know that I can't meet in January um, because I'm going to be doing um, field work um, and I'm not going to really have great internet connection to do so. I could. Um, mm -hmm. That's okay. That's okay. So yeah. I think that we we can even uh, get uh, stay in touch through Slack during yeah. this time. Yeah. So then yeah. We, yeah. we think about uh, think about it and then decide what what's the best way to. Just uh, uh, we need to advise John that we are okay. going to pause the the book club, and then I think it's no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that I think that works. And then also, you know, right now, even just after the first five chapters, it's a good halfway point for the book because the first chapters were really just the general techniques. And then they're actually starting in chapter six, going to start going into this particular genomics aspect of it and not just general uh, machine learning techniques and general statistical analyses. Exactly. So I think maybe when we do recap like if we meet w when we meet again um we could do like a refresher session of just the um the first half of the book and then maybe we could start after that what do you think about that yeah yeah okay i agree yeah it's me yeah yeah so that way we're not just going straight into um the genomic intervals and that way we have a refresher of like okay this is what we've done so far um this is where we're going next okay okay yeah uh but yeah we'll just we'll definitely be in touch through slack yeah and we'll let john know <laughs> okay so um merry christmas <laughs> yeah merry christmas to you too have a uh, happy holidays and good new okay. year i hope you have a, uh, a nice time with your family okay Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, Bridget. Bye-bye.